Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to day two of our um, public workshop uh, sponsored by the Committee on Security of America's Medical Product Supply Chain. This is the second day of the workshop. Uh, in uh, day one, we focused on what is critical, how to prioritize uh, the essential products in the medical supply chain. And we talked about how lists are prepared and what criteria go into that. And um, we um, uh, came away with some uh, observations I thought that were, were quite uh, informative to us. In particular, um, what's critical has two dimensions to it, what's medically essential to patients and what's logistically vulnerable, what's potentially uh, open to being disrupted. And from what we heard from our panelists yesterday, that first part was more straightforward than the second part, right? Identifying what's critical to uh, patients, um, you know, it, it's nuanced in the sense that some things are critical within hours and other things might not become critical for weeks, but nevertheless, it's pretty straightforward to generate lists of things that, that you know, we care about making sure the supply is continuous. The other side of what's vulnerable, that has a much more nuanced answer um, because it depends on what type of disruptive event happens. It depends on the status of the supply chain. Lots of things are in short supply before an emergency hits. Um, so the answer, and, and some things are predictable, others are not. So what we kind of got around to in yesterday's discussion was that preparation also has to be nuanced. That is for things that are very predictable, that we can anticipate shortages, um, you can prepare the products, you can you know, prepare supplies, you can prepare capacity and so forth. But for things that are not predictable and there are always going to be such things, you have to prepare in on the process side. That is you have to have robust, resilient processes that can respond to things that you didn't anticipate. Um, and so that's, kind of a diversified resiliency strategy. So that's kind of where yesterday left us. And so we roll into today now looking to sort of peel back a few more skins of the onion. Uh, and we're going to hear first from our panel uh, that are going to talk about their perspectives on practical and tactical approaches, which hopefully we'll flesh out a bit of what should be in a diversified resiliency strategy. And then in the Second session today, we'll hear from end users, the people for whom these supply chains are designed, right? They're the people we're delivering these, these medical products to. And so we're gonna hear from them in terms of their experiences and their perspectives on what's needed. So um, that's where we're headed. Um, I have one piece of, of mandatory business to take care of before we can turn it over to our, our panelists. I have to read a disclaimer. Um, because this is a study that was sponsored by the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response uh, in the Department of um, the Human and Health Services. And um, so uh, I have to note that this is an open, on the record information gathering session. Uh, it is part of um, our committee process of assembling materials that we will examine and discuss in the course of making our findings, recommendations, and conclusions. Uh, but because this is a working meeting, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including the members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. For those of you who are not familiar with the process of this type of, of a study, this is the second of five planned committee meetings. Some of these, like today's, will include public workshops where we'll have opportunities to hear from experts in the field and to receive public testimony. Our committee will deliberate thoroughly on all of the inputs we receive before writing our draft report. Once that draft is written, it will go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee and then the committee will respond to that review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the chair of the National Research Council, the NRC. Only then will it be considered an NRC report. This report is expected to be released in the first quarter of 2022. Further information on this study, including future meetings, can be found on the project website. To finally, to remind um, uh, all of us, we've been charged with a two-pronged uh, task. First, 
we're tasked with assessing and evaluating the dependence of the U.S., including the private commercial sector, the states, and the federal government on critical drugs and devices that are sourced or manufactured outside the U.S. Second, we are charged with providing recommendations to improve the resilience of the supply chain for critical drugs and devices and address supply vulnerabilities or potential disruptions of such products that would significantly affect or pose a threat to public health security or national security. Okay, and last of all, I apologize in advance to our eminent speakers that I will introduce them very briefly only with name, title, and affiliation. All of them are very eminent people with long bios that I could spend a lot of time on, but since we want to learn as much as possible from them, I'll keep those intros short to prevent to permit as much discussion as possible. Okay. Also to that end, I ask our speakers to keep their prepared remarks short at five minutes. The interactive Q&A that happens after that is really the productive part of this. So uh, we will give you a gentle warning when your time is almost up. Okay. All right. Well, with that, we will now roll into the uh, prepared remarks by our panelists. And first up, we have Heather Wall, who's Chief Commercial Officer from Civica Rx. Heather, are you ready to go? I sure am. Thank you so very uh, much for having me. I did want to provide just a brief uh, introduction to Civica because many folks on the call may not know what Civica is. Uh, Civica, and if you could flip to the next slide, please. Uh, Civica is a not-for-profit generic drug manufacturing uh, company started by hospital systems all across the United States. Uh, I called out a couple of things that are pretty important. Uh, it was both the fact that it is a not-for-profit entity, uh, so that health systems that work with Civica uh, can see Civica really as an embedded cost center for them. Uh, and the fact that it was started by health systems. I loved, Wally, that you uh, that you created that, inter that, that kind of starting point for today with the fact that end users, you know, those, those clinicians that work with patients uh, are going to be a part of this conversation. Having that group of individuals really deciding which manufacture or which uh, medications are essential and which medications could cause issues with patients care uh, are, is very important uh, to us at Civica. Uh, we do have about uh, over 50 uh, health systems from across the country that participate as Civica members. It's a little over actually now about 1,300 hospitals across the United States. We estimate that that's about 30% uh, of the acute licensed beds uh, in the United States. And we have health system partners in all 50 states. Uh, we have 40 medications that are in uh, currently being manufactured, and the interesting point of this conversation is because the, uh, the, the, the clinicians and those folks that do provide that clinical care uh, were the ones that prioritize the medications that Civica manufactures. Uh, 11 of those, right at the, at the get-go of uh, wave one of COVID-19, were used uh, in, in, in COVID patient treatment in the, in the facilities and hospitals across the United States. We have about uh, in, in the course of just over a year, we've delivered over 18 million vials. We assess that that, that actually has been served uh, in clinical care about seven and a half million patients. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned that the health systems were from all across the country. That is both deliberate and very intentional. As we think about supply chain and the way that we really need to focus on uh, the essential medications for all patients across the country, it was really important uh, that Civica have a broad representation. So as you can see from uh, the health systems that participate with Civica, we have for-profit entities, not-for-profit entities. We have academic medical centers. We have health systems that focus on rural health care. And with that broad, uh, uh, that broad focus, we, we expect that we will be able to provide appropri the, the appropriate medications that hospitals all across the country need. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that is exceptionally unique uh, and leads directly into the supply chain resiliency and requirements for supply chain is that uh, we do work directly with the with the clinical teams on the front lines. Uh, the Civica does not manufacture any medications unless the hospitals on our drug selection and medical trends advisory committees uh, have prioritized those medications that we deliver directly to them. Uh, we started with a focus on chronic shortage medications, and we did that uh, because those are the medications that had had been making the most negative patient impact by not having them available. Uh, part of our strategy is to assure that we have a stockpile. We, we, we 
focus on building about six months worth of safety stock. And as we get into uh, uh, that, what uh, what is required to have a very resilient supply chain, um, our, our take is that having that essential medication uh, as a safety stock that we as Civica hold for our health system partners allows us to work through any sort of uh, significant fluctuation or patient demand based off of changes in healthcare across the country. Uh, we One of the other really interesting things is because our pharmacists, our physicians, and our clinician partners uh, are the ones that are providing the insight. Uh, we, we do have a very quick and uh, short response time for what is needed. Uh, we saw that very clearly at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, our, our groups of health systems got on the phone to talk through which essential medications were needed right then, right now for patient care. Uh, and the great news about that is as clinical protocols were changing, as clinical chain, uh, protocols were evolving, as we learned more through the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our, our ability to supply critical medications evolved with that, and we were able to do it both quickly, effectively, and efficiently. Uh, because clinicians were the ones choosing the medications that Civica manufactured, uh, it also was very uh, helpful in the national strategic stockpile. In fact, Civica was able to deliver at the very beginning of the pandemic over 2 million vials to the national strategic stockpile uh, that helped in, in really uh, emergency preparedness for uh, patients all across the country. A uh, last slide, please. Uh, flip to the, the last slide, please. Uh, one, uh, so uh, in, in conclusion, uh, I wanted to make sure that it was clear that uh, Civica, again, is a manufacturer that was prioritized, uh, that medications were prioritized by our health system partners. We are firm believers that we need redundant manufacturing and that that redundancy has to go all the way back to active pharmaceutical ingredient, the supplies that go into it, as well as the finished dose uh, 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 form of that medication. We also uh, prioritize strategic stockpiles, and we do expect that our health systems will know where our medications are both manufactured and uh, how, how quickly they can receive that medication. And so we do do direct distribution to our health system partners. So thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to a very engaging conversation. Thank you, Heather. We are too. You've set us up nicely. But before we do that, let's move on to Dan Kistner, who's Group Senior Vice President of Pharmacy Service from Visient. Dan, over to you. Uh Good morning. Thank you, everybody. And thanks again for this extremely important workshop and for organizing this, this session uh, to discuss ways we can continue to come together to solve a problem that has really plagued our country for decades, which is drug shortages. So again, my name is Dan Kistner, and I am the Group Senior Vice President of Pharmacy at Visient. Uh, Visient, if you're not familiar with us, is the nation's largest healthcare performance improvement company. Uh, we support over half of our country's hospitals, 95% of the academic medical centers, and the nation's top adult and pediatric health systems. I'm a pharmacist by background, but in my role, I lead a team of experts to help our health systems lower drug costs, improve their clinical quality, and strengthen the, both the drug and the supply chain resiliency. Drug shortages, like I mentioned earlier, have been around for years and decades and, and are really due to a multitude of factors. But this year, due to COVID, we saw new factors emerge and some existing become even more prevalent. You know, for example, we saw potential embargoes on pharmaceuticals or starting products started appearing when existing drugs in the market were being shown as potential or being identified as recommended therapies for COVID-19. We also saw unprecedented amounts of demand on the same drugs or drugs that were used, let's say, in ventilators, as we know there was a huge increase in ventilated patients uh, in, in states and health systems that were preparing for active cases or some that were truly in the epicenters of the early stage of the virus. You know, when you think about drug resiliency at its simplest form, it can be described as two things. It's redundancy and high quality. You know, at Vizient today, we bring forth solutions to our health system to address that, including our essential medication list. We have made publicly a list of drugs now for over a year where we feel it's important that the FDA, our manufacturing partners and our members have a heightened sense of focus on these 219 drugs that are critical and life-saving. Drug resiliency is important for all pharmaceuticals, but these products are where we should start given how critical they are for high quality care. We also have a private label program designed around those essential medications, Nova Plus, which has been around for over 30 years and it offers enhanced supply and redundancy, including Nova Plus enhanced supply where we have and are holding up to six months supply on over 151 products. 
That equates to over 53 million additional protected units. And again, those are all focused around those essential medications to ensure resiliency. We require manufacturers to disclose manufacturing location, API location, so we can actively trace world events, natural disasters. We have a team of analysts. All they do every day is look at the fill rates across our entire country, again, for over half of the health systems in the country, to identify supply and demand and where we need to take swift action if a new disruption should arise. Finally, we partner. You know, Drug shortages, like I said, doesn't happen because of one issue. And so therefore there won't be just one solution. We partner with other federal agencies, groups on this panel and some on the workshop yesterday to continue to find solutions because there still is a fog that surrounds where all our drugs are coming from and the quality of those products. Thank you again, as I look forward to the discussion today and continuing to partner to find solutions to alleviate this very important problem. So thank you, Wally. Thank you, Dan. Excellent job. Um, all right. So next uh, up, we have um, Craig Kennedy, Senior uh, Vice President of Pharmacy Serv uh, I'm sorry, uh, Global Supply Chain Manager at Merck. Uh, Craig, over Thank to you. you. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, participate in the panel today. Um, I represent Merck, who are known as MSD outside of the United States. And we currently market biologics, vaccines, and pharmaceuticals for human and animal patients in almost every geography around the world. For humans alone, we distribute approximately 8,000 different images of our medicines around the world today. Our supply chains are global in nature, both by design in order to make them resilient and efficient, and also by need because of the fact that we do serve patients in a global population. In recent years, we've had a number of opportunities to test out the resiliency of our supply chains, including, is, as is on the public record in 2017, a significant cyber event that very much affected the manufacturing capability of the business, as well as multiple hurricanes and also most recently, obviously, the global pandemic. It's been very, uh, instructive to us both in terms of testing our own capabilities and also determining what works and what doesn't work in terms of supply chain resiliency. In fact, because of the actions that we've taken during the current pandemic, our actual service to patients has increased across the world, not decreased across the world. And other than situations like where Dan mentioned that, that the demand has dramatically increased overnight, we've had no circumstances where patients have not been able to get our products across the world through this pandemic. What we found important over the past five years are the following things. Number one, the implementation across supply chain management of a deliberate, rigorous risk management assessment and mitigation program. So we consciously make sure that it is part of our procedure and our activity to assess the failure modes in our supply chains and deliberately choose to either mitigate them or accept them in certain circumstances. We also have found that diversification and alternative supply routes are very, very important across the entire world. Concentration risk is one of the most serious threats to a manufacturer, period. It doesn't matter whether it's concentration in one facility, concentration in one geography, or concentration in one supplier. And understanding that concentration risk and mitigating for it is very, very important and has served as well. I want to be clear that doesn't necessarily mean that everything should have duplicative capability of supply. That's not necessarily effective. It's not necessarily a way to get high quality. And it's certainly not a way to make sure that supply remains affordable for patients around the world. We have approached the problem of supply chain resiliency through redundant supply as part of what we do, specific inventory positioning, which is dynamic in nature and routinely evaluated, and manufacturing capabilities that are also flexible in nature and take not just the economics of manufacturing into account, but also the reliability and resiliency in certain circumstances to avoid disruption. 
That set of strategies combined with the risk management program has made us significantly resilient and we've been able to prove that through some pretty uh, major disruptive events over the past four years. So I look forward to the question and answer session here and I really enjoy, I will enjoy being able to contribute to the conversation today. Hey, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, we do too. Okay, uh, next up, Bill Murray, Medical Device Specialist Executive from Deloitte. Bill? Thank you, Wally. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to start by thanking the committee for the opportunity to speak on this critically important topic of securing Amer America's medical product supply chain. Most people are very familiar with De Deloitte um, as a um, global uh, premier uh, professional services firm. As such, within a, our life science practice, we have a, a very broad uh, and deep capability in terms of supply chain, both in the government and public sector, as well as the private sector. And it goes across the ecosystem. So in addition to what I'll be speaking to today, primarily as med tech, of course, we have biotech and pharma. Uh, we also are very involved in the provider side. And so it gives Deloitte a unique perspective that we can see kind of across the ecosystem. And we have tools and analytics that we're able to use um, to support that activity. Um, additionally, just my background uh, briefly, uh, before joining Deloitte, I've only been with Deloitte uh, two and a half years, I spent uh, the majority of my career in the medical device industry where uh, I ended up leading uh, a couple uh, global businesses in excess of a billion dollars, as well as a couple um, early stage startups. And I can tell you that uh, for medical devices in particular, um, sourcing is a constant focus because as an industry, while it is a, uh, it is a large industry, sourcing oftentimes is something that is occurring um, in small dollar amounts uh, in, in the context of what is being done for, say, consumer electronics. So a very critical, critical part and focus of, of this industry is continuously on supply chain and supply security. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as the committee well recognizes, a robust and resilient supply of medical products play a critical role in public health. The medical devices play a key role within the ecosystem presenting a unique set of challenges compared to biologics and, for, uh, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, as we know from the, the, the global pandemic, demand increases were almost instantaneous for certain products such as PPE and then shortly thereafter testing. As the uh, charts below show, and there's some data, uh, in one month alone, there was a 400% increase in N95 orders. Um, and that's a big challenge for uh, a segment where it, it turns out for that aspect of PPE, it's very capital intensive. And so there's not an easy way to just uh, uh, expand production. So that's where you need to have a, a robust, uh, if you will, national stockpile to deal with the, the uh, uh, limitations of rapid ramp up to uh, increased uh, demand. Second, uh, medical device product supply networks by some necessity are complex and in interconnected. No one organization or region has all the capabilities and expertise to address the specialized array of individual components. You can see that here as an example where you um, one in ventilator, an example from one manufacturer, had 1,700 components, and 60% um, of those ventilators were supplied and produced outside of the U.S. You add to that something that uh, haven't yet in this session talked about, but air freight capacity in the month of April reduced by 42%, creating some significant challenges to the supply network. Third, addressing the workforce safety considerations. Um, while all this is going on, uh, the global pandemic, um, the, the um, industry needed to um, find ways to uh, address the workforce safety while sustaining operations, not only at existing levels, but at unprecedented increased levels. And that is a, um, uh, I think a learning out of this is that there's going to have to be um, ways to do that um, in the future as well. And then finally, um, collaboration with government agencies was critical to optimizing responsiveness and allocation of critical products. Um, obviously, in the very beginning, there was limited supply of uh, very important products in, in treating COVID patients. 
Uh, and the industry is not prepared to make those allocation decisions. So working with the appropriate governmental agencies to help identify uh, allocations of those critical products is a, an important part of, uh, of the process. Uh, next slide, please. So just to drill down a little bit more, um, devices are reliant on complex international supply chain. Oh, to, uh, yeah, we're there. Thank you. Um, this, there's a uh, inter, interdependent networks. So I mentioned that before, but just to drill down a little bit more, uh, further, of the 1,700 parts in the ventilator, that's nine tiers of global suppliers um, in dozens of countries. So there just isn't a practical way to then say we're going to um, exclusively domestically source all aspects of, of a ventilator. So there has to be strategic stockpiling, um, potentially for critical components, uh, inventory um, management strategies as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, there was a, um, a lag, but there was a significant ramp up in um, with the uh, industry, domestic industry was able to go from uh, 700 units to over 10,000 units per week in response to the pandemic over some time. The second area of, uh, of um, focus here is specialization, um, which is unique for, for medical devices. That helps to scale and economize uh, as technologic developments occur, but it creates logistical bottlenecks. So we saw this in the beginning, certainly in the, in the uh, diagnostic testing area and with specialized expertise required to develop some tests. So shortages of some of the um, uh, critical supplies, uh, swabs, transport media, reagents, um, with specialized manufacturing capacity maxed out. So of course, if you're missing one uh, piece of the uh, supply chain link, you don't have the, the full solution. Um, and then, uh, of course, again, collaborating with uh, the regulatory agencies to address uh, um, uh, guidance needs helped uh, deal with some of these shortages. And uh, over time, by June, um, manufacturers, in some cases, were able to produce um, 20 times what they were doing in June. And then finally, efficient capacity use. Um, looking at PPE shortages, um, I highlighted some of the traditional manufacturer capacity issues. Uh, there's been a lot that's been said about some of the um, uh, foreign sourcing, et cetera. But another aspect of that is for certain uh, PPE and N95 in particular, uh, there's some capital intensive aspects that um, to expand production um, would have required the expansion of uh, brick and mortar, if you will, to, to significantly expand it. And that just can't happen in a, um, in a very short period of time. So as a result, uh, that's an area where, again, there needs to be some um, strategies around um, strategic stockpiling. Next slide, please. So a few thoughts about uh, practices to mitigate supply disruptions during a, pra uh, during a pandemic. Um, Avoidance of single sourcing, that's been talked about, um, and, and clearly uh, there's examples where um, mi minimizing the, the number of single sources reduces the, uh, the, the risk of, of, of disruption. Supply risk monitoring um, and being able to understand uh, what's happening um, not only within your organization, but also what's happening more broadly within the world. And so if you have um, critical suppliers that maybe are in an area with a, a significant outbreak, that may disrupt their operations in terms of their, their employee staffing, et cetera. Uh, and, and that can then ultimately impact availability. So being proactive and, and working uh, in advance to try to look at where those risks uh, may occur can help deal with some of the um, reallocation, rebalancing of your supply chains. Um, inventory management, it's a kind of a similar theme there in terms of segmenting and regionalizing your inventory so it's not all in one location. And then finally, proactive communication and data transparency. Um, having an open and collaborative um, and transparent interaction so you know where the bottlenecks will be and being able to analyze via dashboards and um, have forms where you can communicate um, where you might have those bottlenecks and how to address them um, through alternative uh, uh, channels is an important part of the process. Next slide, please. 
So enhancing resilience, uh, there's five major themes. Manage supply risk, we've talked about that before. Um, increasing redundancy, safety stocks, uh, regionalized um, supply, enhanced end-to-end -end visibility through digitization. Um, this is a, an important area where um, if, you, if you look at the whole supply chain and, and to the extent you can dig into your level two, level three suppliers um, and have an understanding of uh, visibility, that allows you to, to rebalance and um, be more responsive. Um, and, and data transparency goes along with that. Um, uh, supply chain agility, um, proactively stress testing uh, business continuity plans is something that I think is important in learning out of this crisis um, and building redundancy into operations that are critical that if they go down, uh, would shut down the entire operations. Um, and then having uh, workforces that are cross-trained and flexible are very important. Um, I'd like to also touch on a, a patient-centric approach, and this is something where I think Deloitte has had some um, unique insights. So if you look at some of uh, patient-centric in this context with the uh, behaviors, um, with activities that are going on, there's an ability to project and predict where uh, needs may be for additional um, support for the pandemic as um, outbreaks occur. Uh, and so you can do risk sensing and implement solutions to gain um, understanding of needs based on some of those risks that are happening. Similarly, on the government side, um, we've partnered with multiple state and local authorities as they have uh, um, um, incorporated policies and, and, and laws around um, reopening the, their economies. And we're able to use some of our insights into uh, the pandemic and, and how um, and forecast how uh, that policy could uh, impact um, the need for testing, for example, or, or, or the demand on um, in, intensive care hospital beds and things of that nature. So those collaborations are very important. Um, finally, a couple of key points I'd just like to mention um, that are, I think are maybe unique for MedTech. Um, I, I touched on one of these, but uh, manufacturers are not equipped to make priority allocation trade-offs, really need to have the uh, government partnerships in that area. Um, I mentioned sourcing is a, a major challenge for medical device companies. One of the uh, additional confounding factors is product liability. So oftentimes the uh, dollar volume of what a medical device company is purchasing is very small in the context of what a consumer organization may be purchasing. So I had a personal situation where we were buying 500,000 widgets and the company that was manufacturing it was billing 2 billion a year. And so our ability to really control uh, the location of that source or drive decisions from the vendor were, were uh, limited. Um, and then finally, domestic sourcing is not practical for many products because of the expertise needed uh, for medical devices and where that may reside. Uh, thank you for your time. And I look forward to the uh, panel discussions. Thanks very much, Bill. We really need the perspective on devices. So we appreciate your injecting that into our consideration. Okay, last but definitely not least, uh, we have Nicole Lurie, who is a former Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response. Uh, and currently a strategic advisor to the CEO of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, among other roles. Um, Linda, we're delighted to have you here. Um, please take this. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much and delighted to join you. And I'm sorry that I had to miss your meeting. It sounds like it was terrific. So I think my instructions were first to, to give, as others have, a, a little bit of a definition of supply chain res resiliency and then talk a little bit more specifically about some views here. So, you know, the first thing I guess I would say is the supply chain resiliency is a day-to-day -day issue and not a rare event, and we need to treat it as such. Um, it is really being able to make up for shortages when some part of the supply chain goes down so that the system can continue, um, in the case of the healthcare system, to provide safe quality care to the extent as possible. And if it needs to migrate transiently to some version of crisis standards um, that it is able to do so without compromising safety and quality. You know, one thing I, and I suspect you talk about it, but I think what we need is national resist resiliency overall, not just supply chain resiliency here. 
But I also wonder if we mean resiliency or national self-sufficiency. And I assume that that's something that this group is going to be uh, struggling with as time goes on um, in terms of national self-sufficiency um, and resiliency, um, understanding, you know, the not only the manufacturing, but the stockpile needs to tide us over tough periods or what the plan B's here are going to be really important. Overall, and I know our last speaker also just talked about this, I think we need a much better system to anticipate and mitigate shortages, including shortages of components and sourcing shortages along the way. And there, there very much needs to be a system where these things don't all of a sudden take you by surprise, but that there are for you know essential medicines and devices, some requirements and a regular dashboard that gets visited about this. There needs to be supply chain visibility and action triggers so just like you think about, hopefully, um, starting to make a vaccine in the, in the beginning of a pandemic, you know, whenever there's a new strain of flu, we go ahead and make a seeds, uh, seed virus, for example. I think we ought to treat the supply chain in the same way. You know, you can take a quick on-ramp and then decide if you need to continue or you can take an off-ramp, but we need visibility and triggers that are going to let us be able to do that. We need to bake into that system the kinds of things we generally think about in terms of crisis standards of care, particularly things like con conservation and substitution, and to remember that you don't one day wake off a log, uh, roll off a log and find yourself in a crisis, but that these things creep up on you. And if you take the appropriate steps, you can actually stave off or avoid a crisis altogether. Obviously, we can't do what we need to do as the U.S. government in the supply chain without industry participation and collaboration and understanding the policies and authorities that are needed are going to be really important. Um, and then finally, um, we need to think about ways to encourage flexibility and innovation here. So if I'm asked to talk about what's worked so if I think about other times that we've been in supply chain issues, at least during the time I served as assistant secretary, and I'll point both to PPE crises during both H1N1 and Ebola, what I would say is that the, the manufacturers and suppliers didn't really want to come to the table to be able to share with a level of visibility what was needed to understand where things were in the supply chain and how to mitigate those supply shortages. The threat of the DPA worked pretty well, but um, I think particularly what we have seen through this pandemic has made me feel pretty strongly that we probably need um, some additional authorities to require um, more visibility that would be key to one sort of public health emergency or another. And I hope that that's something that will be teed up as a lesson learned um, from this pandemic. The other thing, as I mentioned, that's worked really well is practice managing spot shortages of all sorts of things so that when things get really bad, it's sort of second nature to do those things. And whether they're spot drug shortages and anesthesia meds or antibiotics or normal saline or any of the kinds of things we've experienced, um, it also helps the whole healthcare system become more resilient. And if we're talking about supply chain resiliency, it also means that the delivery system has to be resilient enough to manage uh, either short or long shortages in the supply chain. A couple of things that haven't worked very well um, that um, I wanna highlight. You know, one is this idea that when you're in a crisis, you can just do some sort of a challenge and competition, hope that innovation is gonna bring you great stuff and that it's gonna solve your problem for the long term. I think the challenges and competition and innovation is really critical and really important. But particularly if you're doing it for stuff where there's no market, you need to think really carefully about what you're gonna do at the other end of this to sustain the gains you've made. And I would point to the PPE that Hopkins made after Ebola as part of that challenge is a really great example of something that there was no good market for and, and didn't sustained. A second thing that hasn't worked well is forgetting about the end-to-end -end issues here, including 
how you might um, allocate and administer products that are in short supply. And we have to look no further than our current chaos and crises with monoclonal antibodies um, to think about number one um, or some of the other therapeutics, the allocation issues, even if you have a, a stockpile or even if you have a control tower, the allocation issues um, are huge. And at the end of the day, the end user has got to be thought of as part of the supply chain. And then the administration issues have to be thought through very well in advance. I know, again, at least during the time I was in Esper, a number of the bioterrorism products that were part of the strategic national stockpile ended up, we ended up giving a great deal of thought to how would you actually use this stuff? How would it be administered? Um, and sort of really working through the processes, including the supply chain issues that would be required to actually do those things. And then, you know, finally, as we go forward to think about a resilient system, I think this adage that um, good response is built on the back of strong day-to-day -day systems is really important. So building systems that you're not going to use every day, day in and day out, I don't um, think is going to be a very viable approach to this going forward. So in some, in some, some of the policy solutions, I think authorities to get more visibility into the supply chain, including for sourcing, are going to be really important to have authorities and responsibility and accountability for the entities within government that are going to keep track of the supply chain and all the sourcing required for the essential medications and essential devices that are needed um, with regular reporting and dashboards and all the sorts of things that you would need ultimately to support supply chain resiliency and a control tower will also be really important. And I guess I think that in both of those cases, there's probably legislation and new authorities um, that are required. And then finally thinking through really carefully when domestic sourcing of things is not going to be an issue, working through to the extent possible, the substitution issues long before you're in a crisis is also gonna be helpful. So let me just stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Nicole. And thank you all of our panelists. Um, that was outstanding. And I can tell that it's outstanding because sometimes I have to ask a few questions while my committee mates, you know, sort of get their thoughts together to ask questions, but I already have hands up. So you've stimulated questions, all a bunch of hands. So let's go right to it. Marta, why don't you take it first? Thank you so much. Thank you for excellent presentations. Um, so I wanted to pick up on um, Dr. Lurie, uh, you were uh, speaking about the need for transparency around the supply chain. And, and uh, it, you know, this is not the, this has been an issue that has been raised many, many times. And, you know, in my understanding is, for example, from uh, Vizient, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to go to manufacturers when there's multiple manufacturers and you can play the, I will sign with somebody else if you don't share the information, but it's awfully difficult to have manufacturers disclose it and I think previous attempts to try to gain this transparency have not been necessarily sort of embraced broadly. I'm wondering if this group can speak to why that is. Why is it so highly proprietary and so highly protected? It's, it's, it's um, what's the downside? What's the threat here? And I'm, for example, thinking, you know, um, uh, one good example is uh, we did not know that Doxel was made, I think it was Doxel, Aaron can correct me, Doxel was made in the Benvenue plant until until it went into shortage and Johnson & Johnson or, or, or Jensen Pharma actually made that publicly available. And so I guess my question is to this, to this uh, group of experts, what's, what's the threat to pharmaceutical manufacturers and why do they want to keep it so kind of proprietary? So, I mean, I can only speak, I think, to my own experience, you know, not as a manufacturer, but trying to manage this. And I would make two comments. I mean, my own sense has been, you know, that the threat that was expressed to us in the U.S. government was largely that they're all competitors and anything that gives a competitor visibility into their supply chain or their customers is a threat to their business. And so, in fact, there are ways to do this with maintaining 
uh, the privacy and confidentiality of the supply chain. And I would note, um, without trying to get too political here, we did it in H1, N1, we did it in Ebola. It wasn't rocket science. We did it within existing authorities and a lot of arm twisting. And it should be and should have been possible to do it in the current situations that we were in. Having said that, authorities are gonna make it a lot easier. Oh, Nicole, I I, to, go I, ahead, Dan. I'll come at after you. Go yeah, ahead. Thank, no, thanks, Heather. Mara, it's good to see you again, too. And I, I would just I totally agree with what Nicole's saying. I mean, they are all competitors against each other. Many of them are publicly traded companies. And anything they can do that opens up risk for them is an issue. I mean, if you look at the reasons for drug shortages, what's the number one documented reason for drug shortages? Unknown, right? And that's because, again, the, the supplier community <laughs> doesn't, may not feel that it's in their best interest to state that publicly. What we need to do and what we've been working on is we have to change the game. So it has, you just have to change the game. It has to become a requirement. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. about, you know, we require manufacturing location. We've been doing that since 2018. Why do we do that? Because there was a hurricane that hit the island of Puerto Rico that left us all wondering what products were going to go short. And again, we know that the IV solution market was primarily the biggest deficit that came from that hurricane, but there were dozens of plants on that island. Primarily, many of them were branded manufacturers and where we didn't see any issues in their supply chain, but we have to require, we require API information now. You know, we have over 10,000 data points around where our products are manufacturing, where the, the sources are and where the API is coming from. We just have to require it. Mm -hmm. We have to change the game. And I think that's the biggest thing we need to do moving forward. And I would completely agree with you, Marta, to that question, you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, uh, we really just have to be brave enough to step forward and to make that uh, become the standard, make that the norm. You know, at Civica, we actually publish on the label that manufacturing location, and we share with every one of our health system partners where the API is acquired from, where the active pharmaceutical ingredient is acquired from, and the physical location of manufacturing, both country and uh, an actual physical location. And I think we just have to start setting that as a standard mm -hmm. and as a requirement, it is definitely a difference. And it probably does go back to strategic advantage uh, for the for uh, the way people assess what that, uh, what, you know, what, what competitive information could be taken from that. Uh, but as we set that as a standard, uh, the expectation is other manufacturers can, should, and would follow that. Uh, so that, and it, it is, absolutely from a patient safety perspective, something that we should uh, start, at least from a health system perspective, uh, to, to really emphasize and state that it is a requirement because it can impact uh, what, you know, what patient care looks like if we don't know where the medication is manufactured from, if we don't know where the active pharmaceutical ingredient is coming from. So it, it really is, uh, from my perspective, something that we should be setting as a standard and working towards, uh, regardless of who the manufacturer is. And just briefly from a medical device perspective, if I could, um, the, the same issues are there, except that oftentimes components are not interchangeable. And so it, there's another level of detail of complexity that comes in. So you can't necessarily take component A and put it in component B. And so that's, a, that's an aspect that needs to be considered. Matter, uh, the, the, so one other just quick point I might make as I'm just listening to this and Heather, I think, you know, your comments, um, just really hit home to me. So um, as this committee is thinking about recommendations and it being a patient safety issue, you could think about a case for um, using Medicare conditions of participation and um, identify that hospital suppliers, I mean, hospital purchasers um, should only do, you know, might only do business. Oh, I'm sorry. I cut off, I cut off Merck's perspective. My apologies. Um, okay. the, the conditions of participation, or you could do it for federal contracting. So, sorry, apologies. Oh, yeah. yeah, no problem. Thank you. And thank you, Marta, for the question. It's actually one that we see a lot. And certainly there are commercial reasons why um, we want to maintain, in some cases, sources as proprietary. But there are many other reasons to consider as well. And let me offer you a few that, that you may not have thought about. One of the most important ones is mm -hmm. actually security of our facilities, whether they're internal facilities or external facilities. We need to rigorously protect the security of those facilities, not only for our own supply, but also for the, the protection of the product from the patients. 
we, as one example, deal with um, a significant degree of counterfeit um, threat throughout the world by um, having circumstances where components for or discarded components or waste of, et cetera, from some of those facilities are actually reused in the um, legitimate supply chain. So we take the security of those facilities also very seriously. One other point for you to contemplate as you're thinking about that as well as the following. It's quite convenient for us to think about supply chains as simple steps in terms of a source, an active, a drug product, and finally a, a dosage form. However, the reality of those supply chains in even simple oral dosage forms is that they have many thousands of components, some of which turn up in the active ingredient, some of which turn up in the drug product. And so actually just to be told the manufacturer of, for example, the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the drug product gives you a false sense of security about supply for that specific product. In fact, many times when we have drug shortages, they will come from components or from elements of the supply chain that are not necessarily the active pharmaceutical ingredient or even the main ingredient. And so when you're contemplating what transparency might look like and how it might benefit the patient, you do in fact need to actually um, contemplate the complexity of it as well. What I would suggest to you is that Transparency is an important arm of what any uh, patient or any customer should demand. However, it is not the only thing. And I would contemplate for you, as some of the other panelists have said, that the ability to understand the, um, the resiliency of the supply chain as measured by alternatives, as measured by stockpile conditions, as measured by forward looking demand, et cetera, is a more productive discussion with manufacturers than just where do you make it? Yeah, Craig, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a very well stated point. You know, we're looking at even deeper on what are the starting materials that go into the API, but then where does the rubber stopper come from? Where does the glass vial come from? I mean, there have been drug shortages due to glass issues. And so again, you can't just stop with manufacturing location API. You just got to go all the way to the end. I would just very quickly add to that. It's also not necessarily the components. Somebody mentioned uh, earlier today the shortage, for example, of um, monoclonal antibodies um, that are currently uh, being demanded in the world. It is not just the components themselves, but in some cases, the manufacturing method may have single use or other pieces of equipment, which are also in shortage as well. And so if you looked even, and again, I'm taking a solid oral dosage form as a simple form of a medication, some of our most popular forms of solid, solid oral dosage therapies that are sold in the United States literally have bills of materials that explode out through 8,000 different parts that go into making them. Those are made through many, many, many facilities through many steps around the world. And that's why I would just caution against the notion of simple transparency of where might something come from be a countermeasure to resiliency on its own. Very nice. Machine, do you have a question? Uh, sure. My question is for Bill Murray. Um, so we heard on a committee yesterday during a presentation the importance of uh, kind of tracking supply risk and monitoring it and how there is no system at the state level, let alone the national level currently in the United States to track that. Uh, are you aware of any systems, real time or near real time systems anywhere that do kind of uh, effectively tracking of the supply chain with respect to any supply? Uh, not at that level, no. I think um, I, I don't have a, a good answer for you on that. I'm sorry. I think uh, it's a need, but it, there there isn't anything that I'm aware of that you can do tracking. The the, the level of tracking that we do at Deloitte is more kind of at a um, um, meta-analysis level where we're looking at uh, behaviors or policies and seeing how that would influence a demand um, potentially or influence a, a need for um, yeah, hospital beds, et cetera. 
but we don't have, if you will, at a product level, the kind of information you're talking about. Lewis? Yeah, hi. I found these uh, presentations spectacular. Thank you very much. Incredibly helpful. Um, I have a very high level question, which is definitely directed to Bill and Craig and probably Nicole, but everybody might have something to say about it. Um, Craig described a very impressive risk assessment and mitigation regime that Merck is using. Um, uh, Bill was sort of proposing uh, that device companies use such regimes, and I'm not sure whether the extent to which he was saying that they already are or whether that was, uh, um, you know, uh, a, an ambition. Um, but when a private company uh, implements a risk assessment and mitigation regime, they are trying to maximize their profits. I mean, that, that, that's their job, uh, is to maximize profits. And what I'm wondering is, to what extent does a profit maximizing risk assessment and mitigation regime fall short from a public health perspective? And how can government help address that gap? And how can we as a committee think about when the profit motive, when you know profit maximization will lead to public health maximizing results and when it won't? Actually, Lewis, I can uh, start if that's okay. Um, thank you for the question. Firstly, I, I actually just want to dispute the the um, nature of the question a little bit, which is that the reason for our risk management is in fact a, a profit motive um, driven uh, assessment. That's not true. I will also um, add into it that actually just, you know, it should be evident that if we're unable to sell our products, then clearly, you know, not only do we not meet the public health need, but we also suffer reputational damage. And in addition, we don't make the profit that you described there as well. I think, however, you do raise a really important point, which is something for the committee to consider and be careful. The, the notion of a risk management plan is in fact there to you scientifically assess risk in a way to guarantee continuous supply of product where possible. However, the mitigations that you identify as part of that risk mitigation plan can be various levels of cost in the supply chain. And that is a really important point. Mm -hmm. Categorically, I can state that requiring companies to duplicate everything is a great way for the cost to go up and potentially for the um, quality of the product to deteriorate. A facility that is not used regularly is not a facility that is going to be regularly available for producing high quality product at all times. So it's not so much that the um, risk management um, activity is aimed at profit or is in, in um, contradiction to making profit, in fact, if anything, it is there to help you avoid costly circumstances. Categorically, disruptions like what happened in Hurricane Maria or even in the cyber event that affected Merck were extremely expensive. There's no two ways about it. It's fortunate that companies like Merck also have principles of you know, meeting their public health goals because that is where we choose to spend that money in order to make sure we do that. What we do very carefully determine are associated with those risk management plans is what is the right most effective way to make sure that we are buffering against that risk while also being responsible to our patients and also to our shareholders as well. What I would say to you is that regulators currently have existing mechanisms where they have the opportunity to evaluate those risk management plans either by the FDA in some cases, or by other regulatory agencies as well. And I would encourage the use of those existing mechanisms to actually make sure that companies are doing that. And if I could just say, I, I didn't mean to suggest that the manufacturers are heartless, you know, uh, uh, um, accountants uh, <laughs> here. I, I was just suggesting that, you know, they, they, they do have, um, uh, a job of making profits and that sometimes the public health goals are in tension with those overall goals. But please don't take my question as any kind of 
accusation I know about the authentic public health uh, mission that many people in, in both the pharmaceutical and medical device industry have. Thank you, Lewis. And I, I do, you know, I, I did, I could not make sure that was unclear, but I, I will tell you personally, I didn't take it like that. And I also want to be very clear. I understand the underlying point you were making, which is like, look, risk management is not free. Therefore, by definition, you are spending money that may or may not be necessary over time. That is a fact. However, the long-term goals, if you look at it in the long term, would tell you that having a good risk management plan actually is consistent with a good profit-making motive at the same time. Right. And I would love to turn that, uh, it, it just turn the language just a little bit, uh, Lewis. You know, the, the risk management, absolutely essential, uh, appropriate, but assuring that we have a quality management system uh, that is first and foremost in place, first and fo foremost, uh, where that the end result is again appropriate patient care. Um, really, those two things go hand in hand. That it, as long as that quality program is both implemented, followed, uh, analyzed, and really uh, assured that the metrics for, from a appropriate quality management are followed, uh, that risk the risk mitigate the risk mitigation strategies that also need to go into in parallel with that, I do assure that the patient uh, is the first focus and hopefully will eliminate some of the some of the uh, safety concerns. And and it will also hopefully uh, improve, uh, you know, the, the cost of that medication by lowering that cost of medication as well. Yeah, and Heather, I would say you're exactly right. I mean, when you think about what's missing today is that quality metric. We have an NDC to an NDC or a product to a product. And we have no abstain way of looking at which one's better from a quality yeah. standpoint. And yeah. so without that, you're lacking the incentive for a potential manufacturer to do more. And you're lacking the incentive for a buyer or a purchaser to purchase the higher quality pharmaceutical. So, you know, the biggest thing that we run into is if you just pay more, we'll have higher, we'll have better products. We'll have higher quality pharmaceuticals. There is no feedback mechanism that both incentivizes the manufacturer and the end user to do so. And so again, I, I really applaud the FDA on the work they're trying to do to build that system up and that recently released. And that's really the direction we need to get to. That will solve a lot around resiliency and motivation and the right incentives if we can have metrics in place that are completely absent today. And I'll just add from a medical device perspective, there's a number of unique aspects similar to what was said before. Um, the most costly thing is, is impact on patients. The second is not having product available to sell. Um, and so there is a strong focus on product availability. What's happened in the medical device industry over the last few decades is many of the tier one suppliers have chosen not to support the medical device industry because of product liability is one example. And so you end up, uh, it's a big headache trying to find reliable sourcing of componentry and materials because of the liability risk that those vendors do not want to take on. And so that's a that's a very specific uh, issue and challenge that um, the medical device industry has. Um, and then obviously it's a heterogeneous industry. So when you're talking about PPE, that's very different than when you're talking about a ventilator or, you know, or, or a bypass system or something like that. So um, so that you know some of my comments in terms of the processes are generic and, and there's different, um, I'll say levels of sophistication and uh, capabilities amongst different segments of the industry. Nice, Asha. Thank you all for um, these excellent presentations. And I have a question probably for everyone, but um, Mr. Murray and Dr. Lurie, had mentioned and touched on um, transparency and data visibility, which um, it made me think of situational awareness. And um, how do both of you, how did you envision that data extraction of um, what supplies and components are, uh, are in, um, in this dashboard? Is it manually reported? How is it extracted? And then where do you envision that information going? What government entity? Is it to the Strategic National Stockpile, FDA, um, ASPR? Um, just if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. 
I can, I can speak uh, to an example that we've had at Deloitte with very early on, um, we stood up what we called a testing coordinating center. And it was an activity that was not for profit from a Deloitte perspective, but we saw a need where we had visibility into the supply side from the manufacturers, as well as what was happening on the demand side. Um, and so well, we basically created an ecosystem and we worked uh, with the, the Rockefeller Foundation, in fact, on that. And so we're, we're reporting uh, on a daily basis uh, the number of tests that are occurring and, and looking at some of the information as it relates to you know, positivity rates and, and other things. And, help, and, and that information is being used by various state and local governments to help forecast what that, uh, how that relates to their, say, hospital bed capacity or need for additional supplies. So that would be an example. And that, that's a digital activity, if you will. So the, the data has to be available in a digital format. So, you know, I might I might just respond from this other perspective. I totally agree with with all of of Bill's comments here. Um, and Asha, I think your sort of observation about situational awareness is is very well noted. And I think you know the committee I think is really going to need to struggle with doing what's practical and not boiling the ocean. Obviously. Much of the situational awareness work across government has not worked out as well as one might have wanted with the different users. And so I think the focus is going to be really important. But I think there's been so much progress, particularly with AI and particularly with systems that promote interoperability, that um, to the extent that you were focused and had a pretty discreet list of things that you were most worried about and could prioritize amongst them. I do think that getting to a decent situational awareness a dashboard would be critical. And, you know, you have to ask yourselves the question about, you know, you got to start with a finished product and, and work backward. You don't necessarily need the situational awareness into all of the component parts if you've got a functional system that can notify you um, when you ought to be concerned, um, right. right? And so I think a question about where this sits in the U.S. government is also really important, you know, if we're talking about, you know, essential medications and medical supplies, then perhaps, you know, it sits with the SNS. Traditionally, though, a lot of this stuff, and I think it's very much to the detriment of health, has been situated with the Department of Commerce. And I think that that's been really problematic from being, so you can manage this, maybe to Lewis's comments, you know, from the, from the market um, and trade perspective, but not necessarily managing it, you know, with the public health goals in mind. And so managing it with the public health goals in mind, um, I think needs to be key. FDA as the regulator obviously has a spot shortage program, but also um, I think that there are probably going to be additional challenges of asking the regulator to run um, run such a system. So it'll be a good thing for the committee to grapple with. But um, and I also don't. It's going to have to be a little bit of a whole of government approach. And so just like the FMC used to operate around bringing all the parties with skin in the game together, however this happens. Um, it's not only HHS, but it's DOD, the VA, DHS, lots of other components of government, you know, who've got skin in the game to making this work and are going to have to contribute to a whole government system. Over. And Asha, I would say to Nicole's point, I mean, we should build on the momentum that we've seen in the partnerships, relationships that through COVID. So, you know, as I think about, we were supplying daily data that we were tracking on over 50 essential medications, many of them used in ventilated patients or COVID therapies, to the FDA, to FEMA, to the National Governors Association, right? So we're looking at supply and demand on a daily basis on where fill rates are because, Nicole, you made a brilliant point earlier, allocation, that's firing a warning shot after the war is potentially already started, right? And so how can we get ahead of it as much as possible. And I'll tell you again, we learned so much through COVID because we saw that demand we talked about. Again, you had drugs that overnight demand increased a thousand percent. And why is that a big deal? It's a big deal 
PPE, ventilators, very important as well, but car manufacturers cannot make generic sterile injectable drugs tomorrow. And when you say to turn on a line or build a, you know, increase production, you have a three week sterility period. You have four to five to six weeks at the earliest before you actually ever get it out there. So, you know, we have to be ahead of this as much as possible and we have to be informed. And I would just say we should be pushing on the relationships, the data, the Vizient, Civica and others have provided Merck through COVID on a continual basis. And it's like, even if when COVID is gone or not in our lives in a daily matter like it is today, we have something that we've built that can work for other shortage issues as well. Dan, I could not agree with you more. You know, and I think there's two things that we need to, to make sure that we continue to call out. It's that speed of data aggregation because it does not matter a month from now the way we're treating patients today and where that data goes. Uh, so, you know, if it is not ending up in the hands of the care providers that are using that data to make strategic decisions, whether it be purchasing decisions or whether it be clinical protocol development, uh, that data needs to make its way all the way down to the hands of the healthcare providers and it needs to do it in an almost real-time basis, which is what we absolutely have learned over the course of the last nine months. You know, nine months ago, if you would have asked, you know, is 24-hour turnaround time on where medication is being purchased and where it's going and, and who is using it uh, appropriate and available, my answer would have been absolutely not. It takes it's it takes a longer time frame to get that where it needs to be. We, but we have kind of come together as a country to make sure uh, that we can get that information into the hands of the folks that need it. So we should absolutely be building on that. Excellent, Marta, back to you. Thanks, Dave. I wanted to um, uh, go back to the discussion that, that Lewis started and, and you know, Heather, you talked about uh, quality and sort of having transparency around quality and Dan talked about quality metrics, but I think Dan was talking more about sort of uh, publicly available metrics uh, that that you know the supply channel um, participants can see. But actually, when Craig, you know, when you made your first presentation, I was listening to it and I was thinking like this really sounds like a lot of what FGA was trying to capture through the quality metrics. And I do know that a lot of companies do measure some of the metrics that FDA was interested in. And my understanding is, is that, you know, this, this big effort with the guidances from the FDA, and this would be information only for the FDA, which to a large extent I understand is gathered. I mean, I know that, that there's probably a lot of nuances. That didn't go off the ground. It's now just a voluntary pilot, If I'm, unless you, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So there has been um, a lot of resistance it sounds like from industry around creating sort of much easier way to for FDA to get a sense of this, even though it would not be publicly available. And I wonder um, if participants in the, you know, if, if, if our presenters could speak to, um, you know, sort of the, the what is, is the FDA quality metrics the right thing to do? And what would it take to make that happen if you think it's a good idea? And, and what's been the stumbling blocks? I can speak to this from a, a medical device perspective because I worked with FDA from in a prior job on quality um, for with CDRH. Um, and one of the first things, and this wouldn't be for uh, products like PPE, but um, unique device identifiers have not been a or just recently added requirement to medical devices. And so that piece of the equation, needed to be put in place first to have the infrastructure to be able to track a device to a patient. Um, the other part of that is connecting that device identifier back to the electronic health records. And that gets into the provider side of the equation. And so th the structures are being put in place. So the agency is so, and the manufacturers, the ecosystem is just challenged with, you got to get all this interoperability and you've got to get the data and you have to get what's in the claims form, into the health records, into the, the device manufacturer's records, and then to the FDA. Yeah, I think um, I'd just add uh, another thing to it, which is that, Marta, you, you talked about um, your potentially pushback from industry as one potential reason why it hasn't gotten off the ground. I think it's important in those, in programs like the Quality Metrics Program, to make sure that industry understands how those data are going to be used and that the transparency actually flows both ways. So I'm not sure that what you're seeing or what you're, you've heard about necessarily is a reluctance to be able to provide those information. 
it's more a desire to understand how they may be used and consumed. And the, you know, in, in some senses, if it's another regulatory enforcement mechanism, then we clearly want to understand how it's going to be used. And also it is difficult um, to take a homogenous set of quality metrics and apply it across a large different number of types of manufacturing or supply at the same time. So the homogeneity of it is also a difficulty as well. What I wonder, however, is that whether that would actually solve the problem that in some cases is being proposed here. If you look at supply outages that happen in um, pharmaceuticals or biologics or vaccines or devices or even in PPE, for example, they can happen, as other panelists have spoken about, for a large number of reasons. Some of them are chronic in nature. Over time, something has degraded and we could have potentially predicted it. Some of them are acute in nature, in which case something just breaks and you just didn't know it was going to happen. In addition, some of the types of things that can go wrong also occur and actually impugn product that has already been made, right? And so the shortage becomes immediate, not because there wasn't stuff made available, it's because out of an abundance of caution, that product is held and not made available to the market until the problem with the manufacturing or the supply process is actually, um, is actually cleared. And so, by themselves, they may not necessarily provide an additional degree of planning capability for people looking for supply chain resiliency. It's important to note that in most cases, not only the FDA, but also other regulatory agencies around the world provide transparently available information about the status of inspections. Either they can be recovered or they can be made available. Those kinds of things also are a good benchmark over time of whether or not a manufacturer is a high quality manufacturer. Another example that is being clearly shown in COVID, which is not necessarily related to the manufacturer of goods, but also to the supply chain itself, was what happened when airline traffic actually stopped as a result of borders being shut down around the world. In those circumstances, people learned very quickly that a large portion of cargo transport actually goes in the underbody of passenger planes. When that capacity is not available, all of a sudden, those cargo, that transport is not available and there is a shortage of ability to get something to the market. It, it's true that even transportation mechanisms currently require qualification. So you can't just rapidly shift from one method to another without an appropriate qualification route. And that would lead me to ask the committee to consider, are there ways to, um, to increase the resiliency of supply chains or create alternatives by making sure there are appropriate regulatory measures that are quick in nature to allow quicker qualification of alternatives, no matter what the, um, no matter what the method of, of manufacture or supply may be. That slowness in qualification can affect the resiliency when bad stuff happens. Thank you. Matt, you're posting some interesting things in the chat. The floor is yours now to say them out loud. Uh, actually, I, so I didn't want to say those things out loud. Um, I, wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to say something else. Um, Heather mentioned early on um, the uh, the process or alluded to the process that you had used to develop the list, which included some level of sort of stakeholder engagement. Yes. Um, and it raised for me at least um, the question for, I think for all of the uh, panelists about how equity considerations or so, the so-called equity lens can be placed on these supply chain challenges. And we've had some sidebar conversations um, during other sessions about the distribution of the monoclonal antibody. And, Al and Nikki mentioned allocation um, decisions. It made me wonder, you know, so which organizations are part of Civica RX and have access to your stockpile? And, you know, are there rural hospitals? Are there small uh, facilities that are part of this? 
Same with the Visient um, system, which you know is wonderful, and we benefit certainly at my institution. Um, but we also don't see the shortages at my institution that are being seen across the rest of our state right now. And so, you know, this is a little bit of a diffuse question, but I'm wondering in what places um, from the development of the list all the way through the process to, you know, getting needles in arms, um, do you see the ability or the value in, in sort of putting an equity lens on the work that we're doing? Matt, I'll, I'll start and let anyone else uh, answer that as well. I would say in all places. So uh, when I started the conversation with this group, uh, one thing that I really want to be very clear and emphasize is uh, any health system across the country can be a part of Civica, but the we were very strategic in nature in the uh, health system partners that we asked to sit on our drug selection advisory committee and our medical trends advisory committee. And it was to exactly your point to assure that we were representing patients in every area of the United States. So looking at um, health systems that served uh, academic medical center uh, patient populations, as well as health systems that oversaw uh, 50, 60, 100 very small rural community centers, so that we are looking at medications that really do focus on patients all across the country in all 50 states, in rural and in urban settings, uh, and with different types of both comorbidities and um, a real uh, therapeutic areas of focus that need to be focused on. So from an from a equity perspective, I think we have to assure that we are getting the input and the dialogue uh, from, from, uh, from the most broad perspective that we can and then take that large data set and really, um, I guess, shrink it to a point where we can do something that is actionable from it. So understand what the need is across the country, understand what patient populations we can help impact, improve, and then work with that information to then decide which, you know, which essential medications should be, uh, should have strategic stockpiles associated with them because of, because of the breadth of patients that they serve. Yeah. yeah. Heather, I think that's really well said. And, you know, Matt, the way we've always thought about it, we're all in this together. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you just got to look at the bigger picture. And it talks about, again, that Vizient, Civica, the FD, no one person's going to be able to solve all of this together. I think the okay. biggest way we start that is, like we talked about our central medication list, the drugs we add to our Nova Plus Enhanced Supply and Hold the Inventory, all member driven. But how do we make all that information publicly available? Yep. Um, you know, one other thing I think that we do is we just want to get the products where they need to go. And so if there's additional inventory anywhere in this country and there's a patient, someone who doesn't have that product, let's get it there. I mean, we had a great example about a year and a half ago, Vin Christine had a national shortage because a 7% market player decided to step out. Again, 7% of the market decided to exit. It created a national a shortage and a tight market across the entire country. We had additional Nova Plus product that was available, and we allowed that to, again, be administered and, and used in non visient members because it's just the right thing to do. And so, again, we hope that as we build solutions and strategies, they can benefit uh, our members, but also benefit the greater country. And how can we share uh, those resources and information so we can all uh, come out ahead? Matt, I'd like to just add two points, if I could. Um, the first one, thank you for bringing up the um, equity topic and specifically the access to care topic. One of the things that is very evident from running a supply chain that was also in the US market is that there is unquestionable differences in access to sites of care for specific kinds of products. And that is true in places that are more rural and certainly true in places that are distant where the healthcare system does not extend in the same way it does around suburban areas. It affects the ability to vaccinate. It, it affects the ability to get access to chronic care. And it is something that needs to be considered as part of making sure that there is resilience in the supply chains for everybody, not necessarily just for those who may have access to it. And that would include uh, evaluating how sites of care play into those kinds of therapies and those kinds of um, vaccinations. I think the um, second point I'd like to make is related to one um, that Dan just brought up. There are cases where because of a potential for-profit motive, 
manufacturers will decide to exit a particular product. And we have uh, cases uh, right now in our portfolio for products which are not significant contributors to the profit of the company, where we, for a significant period of time, owned about 40% of that market. Two other suppliers of that product determined that they were going to exit it and leave one supplier standing. It is a sterile lyophilized product that is used to treat bladder cancer amongst other um, indications and increasing from 40% market share to 100% market share in almost no time is impossible. It's also incredibly expensive. And the average time that it takes us to add a new sterile facility is between three and five years and costs several hundred million dollars to do that. So you go from satisfied demand to on allocation in a very short period of time. And there is no alternative available in those circumstances. So we should also be conscious of those kinds of changes as well. Greg, I think you're absolutely right. And I think having a foundation of what those essential medications are or what those drugs are and having that collaborative around the FDA, around industry, around all of us as patients understand that, that something like that cannot happen. It just cannot happen and it's not in the best outcome of patient care in this country. And so, but I think having that transparency so, it ha so we can get ahead of it instead of after the fact is so important. So I might just add two other things to this really great conversation. And Matt, thanks for bringing this up. I mean, you know, first, I think um, just as a reminder to apply this equity lens to the supply chain all the way down to the, the patient level. You know, I think the National Academies did us all a favor by thinking about um, how something like the social vulnerability index ought to figure into allocation going forward. And to also recognize that there are certain essential medicines that are disproportionately used by our most at risk populations. And so um, thinking that at every step of the way we have to um, apply that equity lens and think about the disproportionate impact for certain populations is I think really terribly important. And then for the kinds of situations that you just talked about, Craig, I, I guess I think again, um, the federal government really ought to be thinking about some of the, the regulatory tools um, and licensure tools it has to prevent those kind of market exits without a reasonable transition plan for the populations at risk. Um, you know, unless a country goes completely belly up or under, um, there ought to be ways to uh, require any company that's going to stay in business to anticipate and signal and work with others around a plan for, for continuity, um, especially for essential medications. I get that sometimes stuff happens and you can't control it, but an awful lot of time you have more control than you think you do. Over. We are officially at our end time, but I would request if you panelists are willing to stay with us for a few more minutes, uh, we've got a lot of discussion going here and I'd like to give our panelists a chance uh, to teach us more. So if, if that's okay with you, I'll continue. Mashid? Have a few more minutes, yeah. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Mashid? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, um, quick question for Craig. Craig, you mentioned that um, you can't expect a company to double production and sustain quality over the long term. On the other hand, and Nikki mentioned how the, that you know developing systems where you can address bottlenecks on a day-to-day -day basis, but also baking in mechanisms where you can trigger emergency increased production, for example. What does that look like operationally and practically from the production end, and how can we incentivize uh, companies to increase production intermittently. Yeah, so so it's it's hard to give a general answer. So thank you for the question. And it's actually one that we wrestle with all the time, right? Quite honestly, we'd love to have two of everything, but actually our experience in in many circumstances is that the way to maintain a really high quality system is actually to make sure that you are executing in a way that you are manufacturing 
you know, consistently. Having a facility start and stop is not a good way to make sure that you have um, high quality coming out of that specific facility. So, you know, the notion of a facility ready and available to you to, to just start for that purpose actually can introduce its own quality problems, notwithstanding the cost of just having um, an asset sitting there, not necessarily doing anything. The way that, um, having said that, you would also have to understand that most manufacturers do in fact design their, pro their processes with surge capacity available, but surge capacity isn't necessarily the, um, the problem, right? It does come down to what is the cause of the actual outage that you may be seeing or the cause of the shortage. In some circumstances, it can be demand driven. I've described some and certainly we've seen some during the COVID period where specific medications or specific therapies all of a sudden bang 400 times what they normally would have been. We saw that with ICU medicines, certainly during that time period. Um, but even having a set of redundant capacity that would be able to be spun up doesn't help you if, for example, something else goes without shortage or something goes into shortage or there a quality problem is detected in a raw material. If that raw material is used in the same way in the same set of facilities. And so it's not that redundant capacity is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just not necessarily the panacea that we all might think it would be. And there are costs that are associated with putting it in place. Now, in a world where cost doesn't matter, it's not worth considering that. But sooner or later, that cost is going to make its way in one form or another to the payer or to the patient, depending on who that might be as well. And so it's not necessarily either a way to assure quality, to assure the actual um, resiliency of the supply chain on its own. And it is a way, largely speaking, to actually make sure that you are increasing the cost of the product over a period of time as well. Having said all that, it is a way that we do use to protect what we do because we want to also make sure where we can that we have an effective redundant capability to protect against circumstances where something may go out. We just don't use it all of the time. So I, I would uh, suggest a couple things to add to what Craig said. Um, so uh, segmenting out resiliency in terms of ability to just in a normal pro uh, ability to respond to you know, acute outages, et cetera, versus um, you know infrequent uh, uh, events like uh, a pandemic where you have uh, unprecedented demand increases, and looking at a, a strategy that has some sort of rubric around the risk of running out. Uh, versus uh, versus the impact, and so yeah, having that framework in place so that you're you're selecting those things that you need to have stockpiles on because you you if you have another uh, pandemic like event or uh, public health emergency you need to have almost instantaneous response versus a, resi a resilient supply chain where you have multiple nodes and you can redirect and um, solve problems in different ways. And so I, I think there's almost a bifurcation of those two activities that needs to be thought through. I, I think, sorry, very quickly, just build on what Bill said. That last comment is something that I believe the committee needs to look at very, very closely, which is that multiple strategies for resiliency are what is going to lead to the highest level of success, right? That is something that's really, really important. And having a homogenous approach to resiliency is not going to solve the problem that you're that you're trying to to solve and that we all want to make sure is solved at the same time. So I really would encourage that that is a point that is taken away from this. Craig, I could not agree with you more. It is an and strategy. You know, for those medications that go on shortage all of the time or that are essential, we absolutely need redundancy. We also need strategic stockpiles. We also need to look at um, how broad and wide the actual supply chain is for those specific uh, medications. So it is absolutely an and strategy as we're looking at each one of those individual essential medications. Some of them might not make sense for redundancy. Many of them 
completely makes sense to assure that we've got multiple sites where those medications are being manufactured because they are so essential for patient care. But that can't be the only solution. We have to make sure that we've got that it is a multi-factored approach. I totally agree, Heather. And I think sometimes we hear we just need more suppliers. You know, we don't need we need high quality pharmaceutical redundance resilient suppliers in the marketplace for products. If you have 10 suppliers who are all okay, that is not going to create a long term solution. I'd rather have three or four committed partners that have high quality pharmaceuticals to solve it and to keep it going for years to come. And, and to achieve that, you have to make sure, and I think this was Matt that, that made the point earlier, that they have an incentive to actually participate right. Right in the market. And um, creating disincentive to participation will end up in the circumstance like we've seen where uh, suppliers will exit the market as opposed to remain in the market if those incentives aren't there. We can like it or not, but it is also the reality of what does happen. There are ways in which this committee can affect that incentive structure by making it easier for suppliers who may be on the edge of staying in a market or not staying in a market to actually produce alternatives, whether that is through new technology, whether that is through more, um, more streamlined regulatory pathways when changes are needed to be made. Those are the kinds of things that can actually help in circumstances where there may be a tough decision whether to stay in a market or not. You're, you're definitely preaching to the choir uh, about a diversified strategy. We definitely recognize that, the and strategy, you called it, Heather. Um, the question, though, is that when you've got a lot of decision makers, you know, in these medical supply chain networks, how do you come up with a sensible and strategy, um, you know, when there isn't anybody orchestrating the whole thing? Um, so... I, do you have any thoughts on this? Because I, I know that, Nicole, you raised this uh, public part, a private partnership in your introductory remarks. Uh, Bill, you mentioned some of the complexity of the supply chains and visibility in yours, and it, it, it's all floating around in what we're talking about. How do we do a better job of playing together? Is it transparency? Is it incentives? What do you think the magic dust here is to, to coordinate um, multiple decision makers in a resiliency response. Yeah, well, I think you, you put it together right there when you said transparency and incentives. You know, when I think about what we do with suppliers today, you know, we'll give them a committed contract for an extended period of time. That's what they want. They want that commitment for an extended period of time to keep their lines going, to keep those products going, to make investments necessary. Without that commitment, there's not that incentive to make those investments. I think of something Marta asked around the high quality, the quality metrics. We have to do that, right? And so we have to be able to make it happen. And we're going to make it happen by how can we make that more transparent? So what the FDA collects, how can we take that and utilize that from a business decision or a buyer's decision around which product's necessary? And then we have to incentivize manufacturers to do it. So if industry puts a higher regard on the manufacturers of the products that go through that system and therefore have a higher likelihood to be acquired and purchased by purchasers and buyers, that's the incentive right there. So I just wanted to come back because Marta made that point earlier. We have to do that. And that's a great example of how transparency from that informing people like Vizient, like Civica, like others will make us help to build the right incentives for the manufacturers to continue in that loop. So I, I, think, I think you hit it right there, Wally, just my, my two cents. Yeah, I agree with that. And apologies, I'm gonna have to drop now. Yeah, no, I agree with it too, but I wonder, you know, if the committee might try to take sort of a couple of case examples, uh, look to and, and really drill down on that set of questions, um, and then try to also look at where there are final common pathway, potentially public-private partnership sort of fail-safe solutions or failover solutions, because I you know, I, a huge part of the federal government exists for times when the market doesn't meet the national interests, right? And, and there are a whole bunch of areas here where the market doesn't always need, meet the national interests, but we haven't yet figured out sort of like the BARDA and the SNS, what, it, what is the solution? And yet I'm guessing that there are a couple of prototype solutions that could handle about 80% of the about 80% of the challenges. And we, if we could get that far, we'd be doing really well. 
Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time, so maybe we can just finish with two questions, one from Lewis and then uh, to Aaron. Lewis? Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm delighted at the way that this conversation has gone, and in particular to Craig, this was is really the, the essence of what I was trying to ask before. I really regret using the word profit maximization, which is an academic term that I didn't mean to use. Um, we have comfortably moved into the mode of talking about profit motive, which any capitalist has to acknowledge is part of our system. And my basic point is that public health is a public good that sometimes requires public investment. And there are some costs that private industry shouldn't necessarily be expected to bear. So the essence of my question was, is there going to be a, if there is going to be a major government investment in protecting the medical product supply chain, where is that investment necessary and where is it not necessary because the private sector will address the risks itself? So that, that, that was my point. And, and this discussion about uh, preserving continuity uh, and so forth is exactly what I was looking for. And so again, I apologize for uh, any, any unintentional loading of my question before. Thanks, Lewis. No apology needed, Lewis. I think, you know, the, um, it was really very, very glad, gladdening for me to see this committee put together. And you're raising issues which are really important. I can, you know, I, I hesitated to say, you know, we are, we are a company that supplies globally. And so we get to see how different governments around the world handle the same situation where the market conditions may be slightly different from what they are here. And it might be worth the committee's time to study what other um, jurisdictions do, not to necessarily replicate them, but to see what works and what doesn't in this circumstance right here. There are some which we would consider to be very successful and some which are nationalistic in nature that don't work, right? you are handicapped by the fact that you've got a, a very large scale heterogeneous problem. And even the, even the notion of an essential medicines list has the implication in it of essential to whom. There are plenty of medicines that we don't see on government issued essential medicines list that I can tell you a patient who doesn't get it considers it essential. Um, and so um, I, I would encourage the committee to think about not one broad sweeping solution, but a continuous improvement mantra that allowed for you know ongoing acknowledgement of the issue and a continuous improvement methodology as opposed to bang, here is the answer. Well put. Aaron, final question. Thank you so much. Super quickly, we have a great perspective from Merck, a, a branded company. Branded products rarely, if ever, go in short supply. Um, we have Civica, which is a, a very unique model. I think the perspective that we're missing is the generic supplier that is barely making a profit. How do we instill resiliency in, in those products? Um, it, you know, until, until we have many more Civicas, what, what is the answer? And, and I don't know if, if Craig, if you have generics at Merck in other markets that, that you could speak to, um, but but I'm just curious. I think we're missing that that perspective. Yeah. As thanks, Aaron. As you identified, we are predominantly an innovative pharmaceutical manufacturer. However, um, there are a significant portion of our products that do compete either with other um, innovative companies or, in some cases, with generic companies as well. And many of our products are actually off uh, patent protection right now. Despite having said all that, I will also say that every innovative manufacturer is still subject to similar pressures associated with cost as many of the generic uh, manufacturers would be. What I can tell you is I think you are onto something there, which is that it is much easier to make a decision not to supply something when your margin is very, very small compared to when your margin is very, very large. If you look at the problem through that lens, either you can try to regulate them to actually make sure that that occurs, that they supply, but I think the number of people you'll have participating in the market will drop as a result of it. An alternative to that kind of regulation 
would be regulation that helps them actually make changes and be dynamic in cases where they do actually have problems. And so studying what's the kind of thing that causes them to go out of compliance or to have quality problems or to not invest in their capital in inventory in certain places would be an important part of recognizing how our pharmaceuticals are supplied today and what might be effective in keeping those suppliers actually able to be economically whole during the course of their manufacture too. That Aaron, I would agree with Craig, you know, the, the, the reason Civica exists is because of the economic issues and concerns um, that have uh, driven a lot of the changes to investment, the changes to the financial position of uh, many of the existing generic manufacturers. And so the question becomes, is there with this group, uh, you know, some of those specific key areas that do need um, additional uh, information, additional involvement, additional uh, uh, investment in the way that we focus on those specific areas, those specific specific medications because otherwise uh, the, the circumstances are going to be exactly as we talked about, which is the economics don't make sense. So those, those medications do become shortage medications. Those medications that weren't historically a concern become a concern and we have to address it after the fact instead of doing it uh, while, they're, while they're still active and robust and appropriate manufacturing for a lot of those essential medications. Yeah, I, and I think the generics, Heather and Craig are right. I mean, they lack commitment too in a lot of those categories. And again, that's why I think commitment is so important. If you're a branded company, no one else can make it. You know you have a sale coming in every day compared to 10 players in a market where you're getting less than 10% of the market share and you don't have commitment. I think it's all comes back to, again, to incentives. And I think the quality that we talked about, we can't understate how important that is. Um, you know, I think we want manufact we want the right manufacturers at the table, right, making the right drugs at, with very high quality, and you need to have incentives to do so. Um, without that, then you're you're expecting it to happen. And we saw some of these generic manufacturers made billions of dollars in tax cuts a few years ago, and the majority of it went back to buying shares of their stock back and not into quality. And again, it's all comes down to incentives, and so we've got to put the right things in place to to make it happen from an industry and a regulatory standpoint. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Heather, Dan, Craig, uh, Nicole, and Bill, uh, for generously giving your time to us. This has been fantastic. You exceeded expectations in every way, and you've given us a ton to think about. I hope you'll be available for uh, follow-on questions if we reach out to you, because we've got a lot to think about and work on, but we will get back to work, and thank you so